My name is Alex Helmbrecht, and I'm joined here today by my co-host, Daniel Binkard. Welcome to The Farcast. Our guest today is Dr. Mary Keithley. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, Mary, you're an associate professor and department chair in physical sciences. Correct. Yes. And I... So when one hears physical sciences, what does that mean? So physical sciences encompasses, so I teach chemistry, but we also um, handle the geosciences and uh, astronomy and physics. So, so all the sciences, not all the sciences, no. but lots of sciences. Not this the is the hard sciences. sciences, it sounds like. Yeah. The tough sciences. <laughs> That's what everybody thinks. I don't think it's that hard. We try to make it accessible. That's good. <laughs> good. It, it's the science that has... Moles, or is that yes, physics? Yes, that's chemistry. Okay, yeah. chemi- yeah, I could. I always got tripped up on those in yes. high school. So I might have to talk to you after this but for some help <laughs> on that. Uh, but Mary, uh, before we get too far down the road, where did you grow up? And, and tell us a little bit, how did you wind up at Shatter State College? Um, I grew up in a suburb of St. Louis called Webster Groves, Missouri. And I originally actually went to school to be a music education major and then changed my mind halfway through. I am not. I was not a traditional student. I worked several jobs before I went back and finished my bachelor's at University of Missouri St. Louis um, in chemistry, and then I did graduate work at Vanderbilt. And once I finished, I taught for two years at Missouri Southern State University in Joplin, and was looking for kind of small, even smaller town. And everybody's like, Joplin is small. It's a town of, but it's still a town of 50,000 compared to here. Oh, that's huge so, by Nebraska yeah, standards. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we wanted kind of a, a smaller location and I was looking for a different type of program to teach in. And so when the job opened, I came and interviewed here on what ended up being a snow day with classes canceled and the students all showed up to come see me teach anyway. And so it kind of let me see what the students and the the campus was like. We've got some dedicated students. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's actually really cool. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. You know, when you had your demonstration, they, sh- they still showed up. That's awesome. They did. It was a packed, it, I mean, it was an entire full room of lecture hall students on Excellent. a closed campus day. So. Now, what year was that? 2018. 18. Yeah, I suppose that's April. Right. April of 2018. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. We usually have a snow day, at least in March or April, yeah. one yeah. day. Yeah, tradition. So. <laughs> when I came in on the little the little airplane, the ice was starting to come in, and everybody's like, did you enjoy the flight? I'm like, no. Yeah, no. I don't like little airplanes. So, so. you survived the flight. You survived yes. a snow day. Yeah, it, it was meant to be. <laughs> you just said, yeah, I'm coming in. <laughs> Trial by fire. Yeah. No. <laughs> so um, I, real quickly, I want to circle back. You, you'd mentioned music education. So yeah. were, are you a musician? Yeah, I play the trumpet. Okay. I play in the community band um, here, and... I love to play. I probably could have done better had I gone into performance, but education, I got to the point where they said, okay, we're going to learn these other instruments. Yeah, that wasn't happening. Uh, (laughs) I was not very good at that, and I'm like, I don't think I could adequately teach this to someone else, and so then I went to my other, when I originally went, I was split between two, science and music, and so I circled back and went the music route, or went the science route instead of music. So I'm curious to know, are, do you feel that there are correlations between music and uh, your field now, chemistry? Um, I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a precision to both, right? Like, mm-hmm. and, and the, the detail level that you have to be to, to be a musician you need when you're doing research and you're running reactions. And so I can definitely see some correlations in the same similar type of type of aspects of what you need to be successful in both programs. Um, I've got a, several of my science students that are also musicians and mm-hmm. do music minors or just play in the band. It seems to kind of go hand in hand, a passion for music and science, whether they're playing or even if they just yeah, enjoy it. Sure. sure. So if, when you're doing lab work, if you've got music playing, what sort of music uh, do you enjoy? <laughs> I listen to just about anything except not a whole lot of country, Yeah. Um, which is really hard up here. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, but, I mean, mm, I still listen to a lot of 90s alternative when I'm in the lab. Uh, that's fun. Yeah. It's probably okay. the, what's mostly on my playlist. Yeah, excellent. So uh, you're the chair of the physics or the uh, physical sciences department. Yes. Um, I hope that comes with like an actual larger than life chair. You know, <laughs> it takes through whoever gets the chair. I, it's a bad joke, but I, I just feel like compelled to make it. But um, 
a little bit what's involved with being the chair, and more importantly, tell us about the courses that you teach in a given year. Okay, so as the de the department chair, I do um, of course well, we handle like getting all the courses scheduled and making sure that everybody has the right number of courses because faculty are supposed to teach a certain number of courses, but it's not like I just make up the list and say, here you go, this is what you're teaching. We work together. I just basically take all of the information they give me and I put it in the format that they need so that right. the OAs can put that in the system. And we work on writing program assessments so we can see how successful our, our programs are. So I get all the data and try to correlate it and present it to the faculty and see if they approve of what I'm saying. This is our strengths, our weaknesses, and so we we work more as a team. I kind of almost consider it like I'm not a supervisor. I'm not in charge of no. people. Mm -hmm. That's the deans. So I, I kind of feel like I just am guiding us towards making those changes to make it a better program based on what the faculty and the department want. I teach... Of a right now, I am currently teaching mostly organic and biochemistry courses, and I do our senior research capstone series, which is all physical sciences. So it's geoscience, chemistry. Um, we don't currently have a physics major; we just have a physics minor. Um, but so all of those students do a research project, and so I kind of guide those students through that project. Is that the one where they do a presentation at the end of it? Yes. So at the end of, so it's a three semester sequence, they design their own project. And then the second semester, they collect all the data. Third semester, we write it into a full thesis and we take them to the Nebraska Academy of Sciences in Lincoln. And they present to in a public peer reviewed yeah. session. Um, and it's really cool to see their own ideas turn into yeah. like that final presentation with their data. And that's pretty rigorous. I didn't realize it was over that three semester period. Yeah. And we say they collect all their data in the second semester. They're not done. It's usually like sure. halfway through the third semester too, because it takes a long time to actually get all that data. And they yeah. don't, it's kind, of, it's kind of like what they would do if they all went to grad school, but they have no time. Yeah. Right? Good I mean, preparation. Yeah. So... <laughs> That's but, for sure. Because they're yeah. going to need it if they go on to school. More yes. Than likely. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's our goal. Is yeah. They're going. But right. we also, science education majors do this project as well. So we get to see everybody in that class. <laughs> that's a good thing. It is. Yeah. It's fun. So, Mary, when, when, where would you say or maybe when would you say uh, your love of science developed? Um. Well, I always liked science as a kid. My uncle was a has his master's in biology, and he worked at pharmaceutical companies. I did not consider chemistry um, in high school. I took the science I thought I needed. I took biology, and I took astronomy because it said it was physical science. And they said, no, if you want to go on to college, you need to take more science. And at first I was resistant. I'm like, I like science, but I thought I wanted to do music. Mm -hmm. So the real love and passion for chemistry came from, they said, okay, well, you have to take chemistry, you have to take physics. And in my high school, the physics teacher didn't have a great reputation, so I went chemistry. And my teacher was phenomenal. She helped instill into us an independence with the science and allowed us to kind of experiment on our own and kind of fostered the passion that we would have for whatever part of the, of the experiments that we were doing. And so she let us kind of guide our own learning and it really changed it to where I went from, I don't want to do science to, okay, now I'm taking the advanced chemistry courses, and then I went on to, to pursue that. So it was a good teacher. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. So I, I'm assuming you, it, it came at least somewhat naturally to you, getting uh, being able to balance equations and that kind of thing. Yeah, I always, I, in, in early chemistry, so in general, like college chemistry, it's a lot of math. Right. So I always really gravitated towards math. Okay. Um, and so that was the easy part for me. Strangely enough, I now focus mostly on organic and biochemistry, which was not, organic was not as natural for me. It's less math and it's more conceptual and applying concepts in a lot of different situa situations. And so in my undergraduate, I had some good organic teachers, some some others that I was completely lost with. And so I've kind of picked up from what I learned or didn't learn from them, and I'm trying to apply that for my students to hopefully capture a broader range. But okay. it started with math, and so that did that part did kind of come more natural. Well, that's good. What's the what's the difference between organic and biochemistry? 
Okay, so organic, so they are related. You really, okay. So we usually do organic first. So in, in chem, it's really a very structured degree. Like you have to have intro chem, the college chem to get to organic because we use all that to understand. Now we're applying it to organic molecules, which are basically carbon and hydrogen based. And then we take the organic molecules and we apply them in biological systems. So to the large biomolecules that most people are familiar with, like fats and sugars and proteins. And we talk about the um, chemical interactions and what's happening in your body to make the cell signaling work. So we, it's a bridge between the chemical reactions and the biology that they're learning. So we usually like them to have biology before they get into biochem too. So it's kind of a mixture of organic and biology together. Okay. That answered my question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I, I would have to read the uh, introductory materials a, a dozen times kind of let it sink in because <laughs> you know I, I did all right uh with with basic physics um you know, basic trigonometry and that so on that side i was okay but i remember that maybe it was freshman year science where we had a little bit of chemistry and, mm. and it just no it was over my head well i think a lot of times like you because you get chemistry in it like in, in every bio course there's a little bit of chemistry in there just like yeah. when you get into biochem we always have biology and so like if if you haven't had the chemistry aspect and they're trying to here, we're going to teach it to you really fast so you can understand what we're doing here. Yeah. It may seem more overwhelming than if you took like an actual chem course. Oh where yeah, we yeah, can you got to wonder. Give you more, more detail and more concepts. Mm. So yeah, that'd be something to try out. Live my life again and throw that into the mix. <laughs> we'll just audit a class, Daniel. So that's sure sure enough, there we go. With all your extra time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be fine. <laughs> Uh, so, Mary, last year you were named the Nebraska State College Teaching Excellence Award winner, which is excellent. I'd, I'd forgotten that. Was that recently? So, yes. Well done. Thank you. Uh, so from there, obviously the students like you. So, I hope so. <laughs> when, when did you figure out that uh, teaching was, was the calling for you? Um, so I originally went to Vanderbilt for my Ph.D. because I was going to go work in an industrial, like, pharmaceutical company. I wanted to do drug discovery. Mm -hmm. And my first year there, everybody was a TA. And I really enjoyed doing that. And I was like, okay, I could kind of see teaching. And then an opportunity came up for supplemental working in a middle school. So I was a science teaching fellow, and I would go one day a week, and I would bring lesson plans and teaching to middle school. And it was working there that I realized I liked teaching, but it was also working there that I realized I didn't want to do K through 12. <laughs> yeah. like, I, I Props to the teacher I worked with. She was amazing. She had great classroom management and had a way with dealing with parents that I, I knew that it was not for me. And so then I kind of also started getting more experience at the college level as well. So I did both, but it was, yeah. it was grad school having that experience. That's that great. helped me figure it out. And so you did your master's and doctorate at Vanderbilt? So I, you, you, do, you do the master's work when you're getting your Ph.D., so you don't actually leave with the master's. You just oh. leave with the Ph.D. You can go do That's nice. a master's, and then you can go do a Ph.D., but a lot of science Ph.D. programs still have you redo a bunch of the master's work anyway. So if you know you're going, you can just do one. So it was just a, how many years? Five, I did five years. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's a lot. You were yeah. doing a lot of work. Yeah. Well, it was five, yeah, five and a half. My, I had, it was, I would have been done right at five years, but my um, PI passed away. And so I had oh. to get another one and so uh, finish up with somebody different. So it was a little, little unique, but yeah, um, got through in five and a half years. So awesome. is, that, is that a case when you do the, where it's essentially masters combined into the PhD? Are you, are, do you have like an overarching uh, project that you're working on throughout that whole process? Yeah, so we, we still did coursework. So my first two years, I still did coursework like you would do with a, a typical master's, but you're able to start your PhD thesis project as a first year student. Okay. So um, I, I was started working on my project by January of my first year, as opposed to waiting until I was done with my master's and then starting and having to do it all mm -hmm. in three or four years separate. So it's kind of everything together. Is there a possibility in that case where, like, is there a chance that you could go down the wrong road and then have to lose a year or two? <laughs> yes. I, I've I, seen it happen. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. I have no idea about this world, no. so I'm really kind of curious so, just in that logistics. Yeah. And every every school is different on how they run theirs. So, like, um, I was it was unique at Vanderbilt because, like, you always do a preliminary exam to say, yes, you're ready to move on. Okay. And, 
and you do, and you, then you qualify, and then you get your thesis. And so ours was all based off of our project. And so some some other schools, it's testing. And so they're working on their project, and they do this testing, but there's no validation that this project is good. So I had right. early on validation that this was a good project. We think it's going to go where you need to go. But my boss yeah. was always cognizant of it, and so Dr. Armstrong would always say, we're going to have you working on these other two projects too. So if something happens and okay. you get scooped, somebody else is doing it somewhere else and you don't know oh, it, yeah. or you've got two or three projects mm -hmm. going on, and then usually by like your third or fourth year, he was like, you need to pick. We've got to focus on one. Okay. So, But yes, that has happened. And what was your project on? So I work on, and I still work a little bit on it, um, I look at antibiotic resistance to a an enzyme called uh, FOSB, or an antibiotic resistance to phosphomycin using FOSB. So phosphomycin is a broad-spectrum antibiotic that they used to use for, like, UTIs and things because you can take a big, giant dose and you don't have a lot of side effects. Okay. Um, but... A lot of people have heard of MRSA, so MRSA, mm -hmm. and now you're seeing vancomycin-resistant staph aureus, so you're getting double resistance, and they're talking about using phosphomycin to combat those. And so understanding how bacteria can become resistant to that is important. So I do the how does it work, and then a pharmaceutical company somewhere can take that information and say, okay, now we know how it's becoming resistant. Can we give phosphomycin and combat that resistance at the same time? And so it, because it's becoming more prevalent, it was a interesting project. Oh, yeah, no yeah. doubt. <laughs> yeah, that, that evolutionary arms race is it's fascinating and terrifying at the same time as, yeah. Yeah, as the bacteria evolve to be more resistant to those. Yeah. Oh. And by the time you get new antibiotics on the market, it's already, there's already resistance to right. it because it mm -hmm. takes so long to get through FDA processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Yeah, they're trying to go back to older antibiotics that maybe weren't overused because it, it's already approved, right? Yeah. They don't have to go yeah, through that whole process. Makes sense. Yeah. So, Mary, you're involved with um, study way opportunities. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about um, what those opportunities have been, uh, and then maybe chat with us a bit about what, what do those students take from those experiences? Yeah, um, we did one last March. We took um, – I was teaching physics last year. Um, and so we took the physics students down to um, Orlando, Florida, and we went to Universal Studios, and then we took a day trip over to Clearwater Beach. And the students actually collected data. We took sensors with us, and they took them on every ride we went on that they were allowed to have oh, cool. things in their pockets um, or on their person. And they collected data, and they were able to take our physics concepts from the classroom and apply them to the rides. And on some of them... A lot of rides, they don't publish, right, like the actual data of how they make the ride or like the acceleration data. But we found a couple of the rides that had that. So we could use that to take their data and they crunch the numbers and our data match the published data. So then they could say on the rides that it's not published. This is what we know about those rides now. And so Excellent. they were able to see all of these concepts we've been working on all year mm -hmm. in a real life setting. And then when we went to the beach, they were able to see, like, the difference in the physical, the waves that we talked about in physics class. And and actually, you can actually feel them, like, if you're ever in the ocean and the waves and you feel it's moving that way, but then you feel it at your feet moving back the other. We had talked about that concept. But until you feel it, you don't really get it. Yeah. And so it, the idea is to let them take what they're learning in the classroom and see how it applies. Because a lot of time in science, they're like, why do I care? Mm -hmm. What does this have to do with anything I'm ever going to do? And so now they go out and they see why. And so we actually have another one we're planning, hopefully in March, we're going to be recruiting students, hopefully to go um, to Las Vegas for a combination of biochemistry and uh, physiology concepts, looking at um, to, like a Cirque du Soleil show mm -hmm. and how yeah. the physiology of the movement is affected by the um, the different muscles and so relating it to anatomy and physiology that way. Um, different um, there's also a permanent bodies exhibit there, which is really cool. They can see down to, like, they, they pull out, like, the vessels. All of, like, they'll have the entire bodily mm -hmm. body of, of blood vessels. It's not something they can see yeah. in, a, in a school setting. Um, biochemistry, we talk about the food and the nutrition. And um, I have a project planned. I don't want to tell them what it is, but <laughs> 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 that, that should be fun. That will relate back to all of the metabolic processes they're learning in my, biochem, too, and relating it to that trip so they can see why does this matter? Yeah. Why do I care? 
And so this kind of this aligns with a, cl a class then that you yes. would be teaching. Yeah. So yeah. then they get to see those concepts in real yes. life. And then they bring it back and they always do a project in the classroom. If they don't go, they have a similar project. They just don't have the same yeah. li real life experience. But yeah. Well, there is a roller coaster in Las Vegas that, that they can ride yeah. if they want. We talked about the roller coaster and then um, there's the big Ferris wheel. It's like the oh, yeah. observatory, yeah. Wheel, high Outside roller observatory. Yeah. yeah, we 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 thought about doing that one because then it's a little slower. So if there's you have the people that don't want to do fast roller coasters, but then the observatory wheel is. I'm not sure. I don't know if I can do it. I don't like heights, so <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on it before. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. No, and the the I mean the the area the that you're in is huge. I bet twenty people can fit into it. Okay. So. Yeah, There's that was the other thing. Room Somebody room. goes, I'm a little claustrophobic. I'm like, I'm told it's big. They're big, yeah. Okay. They are, yep. Okay. So um, definitely got to talk about the Math Science Center of Innovative Learning. And, and yes, uh, uh, in asking what year it was that you interviewed here, so you you were able to experience before mm -hmm. and after for yeah. math science. So, yeah, what's it like? Do you have enough chemistry space in there now? It we, feels like that's what we added, a whole new wing, nothing yeah. but chem. <laughs> oh, there's a, there a whole wing of chem labs, which is which is great. And one of the biggest things that we have, um, our research space has um, state-of-the-art instrumentation that we yeah. were desperately in need of. I mean, most of our mm. stuff either wasn't working or... It was on its way out, and they weren't supporting it anymore because it was too old. But now we've got brand new. We've got finally got an NMR, a new HPLC, all new specs, new chromatographs. It's and we're still in the process of receiving some of those. Oh, so, nice. Um, I just had students using one of our UV vids today. We used a gas chromatograph last week, and so they're actually before when I would teach because they weren't up and running. It was. Well, here's what your sample should look like. Right. I don't know if it does because we can't run it. Now it's, here's your sample, here's your data, and now you know what it, like, if it's pure, what it really looks like. And So what was that first one, UV? A, a UV vis spectrometer. So it um, can look at different wavelengths of light in okay. both the visible and the UV ultraviolet region. Nice. Um, and so we were monitoring a biochemical reaction using the UV spectrum. And so they could see if their protein that they've, Spent the entire semester working on to see if it's working. All right. Spent 13 weeks on it. You hope it's working. At this yeah. point. <laughs> it worked. So we're Good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, kind of in that same vein, uh, talking about the coil, uh, there's a neat tradition that's that's kind of developed during Halloween, and I'm assuming you probably have played a part in that. That creepy uh, coil crawl. Yeah. Say that five times fast, but uh, <laughs> um, tell us tell us about that. What is it? So that was started last year by myself and uh, Dr. Tony Tibbetts um, with the help of Kinsley Mason, who is now a full-time instructor on campus that since Tony has left, she's taken her role. And so Kinsley really stepped up this year and helped plan that um, along with me. But we invited, last year it was uh, the CDC um, kindergarten first and second, and this year we wanted to open it up to third and fourth grade. So um, we had about 350 kids come through during That's the day. Awesome. Yeah, we had hands-on activity. We had, um, so the volleyball team came over, Project Strive, the cheerleaders came. Last year we had some more of the clubs, um, Health Professions Club came down and did some stuff, but we did it on a lab day this year, so oh. we lost out on a few of the groups because they couldn't be there. But um, we, and we had hands-on activity, some science learning. They did some coloring. They went in the planetarium and the geoscience museum, mm -hmm. and they trick-or-treated their way through, so they got candy yeah. all the way through. And so um, third and fourth grade had costumes on, too, which was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And um, the entire physical science department dressed up as Harry Potter characters. So Well, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> so you, you won the door decorating contest, <laughs> That's right? That's right. We did. We were decorated as, plat well, it was Hogwarts Halloween. You went through platform nine and three quarters, and then um, our hallway had the different um, house doors on them. And um, we had name tags up of who, because I was dressed up as McGonagall. Dr. Lighty was Remus Lupin, uh, Dr. Everard was Hagrid, Dr. Keith was Dumbledore, and then uh, Kinsley was our uh, Professor Trelawney. And so nice. we, we had all the names on the doors, and we had, like, the spiders coming out and <laughs> a potions room at the back and um, the jack-o'-lanterns that they hang from the ceiling in the Great Hall. Nice. Up. So, yeah, we spent decorating for that and decorating for the Creepy Coil Crawl all at one time. It was fun. Yeah. 
That was a busy October. It is. It was, it is. Uh, October it is. flew by. It did. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, when you're not decorating the the uh, science building, uh, <laughs> it's Hogwarts. Uh, what, what what are some of your hobbies outside of work? Um, not grading. We already <laughs> talked about that. <laughs> oh, that can't be a hobby. Okay. Um, I spend a lot of time doing stuff with my kids. Yeah. Um, so I do. My kids are very involved. They do dance, gymnastics, 4-H, and Girl Scouts, and so I'm pretty much at one of those four things oh, all yeah. the time. My youngest. Better. Youngest is competing in gymnastics starting this weekend, so um, I, I try to promote, help her get there, and then also, you know, they've asked me to help kind of promote events and things like that. Yeah. Um, I serve as a Girl Scout leader for, and can, a co-leader with um, Kelsey Roberts. She's one of the other moms, and she kind of manages everything, because last year I was so busy, I'm trying to be a little more active this year, but um, so I've, I've kind of helped with that but I, I've done science outreach with with them and with 4-H as well 4-H I just go do what they need me to do I don't have to leave anything <laughs> it's nice but personally I don't know watch movies <laughs> sleep sleep is good yeah it's you yeah, gotta it's recover kind of after all that yeah. Yeah. Well, and you're also involved with Cardinal Key, but oh, yes. I suppose yeah. that's in yeah, work. On campus, um, yeah. I have Cardinal Key and the chemistry club now mm-hmm. we just started one so Cardinal Key does a lot of service activities. They're 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 a great club and they're very self sufficient. I am there when they need help, but they don't ask me for a lot. Um, they're an honor society, and they've they really try to take an active role on campus. Yeah. I think and and get a lot of service done around. So we're looking forward to the JDRF walk in the spring and mm-hmm. um, the Sea Hill celebration. Yeah, that's the other. Yeah, yeah. Sea Hill will be one hundred. Yes, yeah, it's going to be another busy spring. So, Mary, we've kind of reached that portion of our our time today where we're just going to ask you some quick hitting questions. So the first thing that comes (laughs) to the top of your mind. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you what is a favorite movie of yours, but you mentioned (laughs) earlier that your playlist in the lab uh, is consisted of 90s alternatives. So Mm -hmm. um, what would be an ideal 90s alternative (laughs) concert lineup for you to go to? Well, I don't know. I just went to the 311 concert, and that's pretty much all I needed. So, um, <laughs> Where were they playing? The Omaha. Oh, so their hometown show. Yeah, it was yeah. their 30th anniversary. That's so, nice. Years um, already. Wow. Wow. So I kind of do. I kind of go between alternate. So, ooh, you just gave me like a really hard question. <laughs> I don't know. I would. I would say I listen to a lot of 311, Cake. Um. I'm horrible with band names too. I know song, so a few of the songs. Um, my brain just blinked. Well, we've got a good start. <laughs> on well, those yeah. two, yeah, yeah, those two, that'd be fun. That'd yeah. be a great yeah. show. <laughs> well, let's see here. A favorite food experience. Mm. So, actually, the best food experience lately was um, I went on a personal trip out to Las Vegas and did a, a walking food tour. Mm, it's one of the nice. things we want to take the students on because they not only did you get to try, like, five different restaurants, small bites of places that you never would have known were there, but you got a history, too. So it was, like, cool. history and food together and learned all about the, um, the, the town and the area. So it was, it was really cool. That is cool. Yeah. There's great food in Vegas. There really is. Uh, like Fogo every <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We did I'm that, not, too. <laughs> you'll never forget that. The pocket bread. You got to have pocket bread. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, um, okay, what's a favorite research project of yours or one that you've maybe helped guide of the students? Well, I mean, I so I still work on my antibiotic resistance. So it's probably one of my favorites, and I have, like, two students every year working on it. I have two right now working on that. That's um, excellent. But I do, I, I really get to enjoy some of my students' projects. And so I have several going on right now. And I don't know if I could pick a favorite one, but, like, I've got... Uh, I have a student working on elephant toothpaste, which a lot of people have seen. Hmm. It's a it's a chem demo we do yeah. in classrooms to teach kids about reactions and catalysts. And so he's trying to make it a more functional demo where you could turn it into an experiment. And he's tooling around with different variables, and it's going to make, make a lesson plan out of it. I just like seeing them take that research that we do and make it yeah. something effective yeah. for that K through 12. So yeah. that's something a little unique. 
that, that we have going on now. Well, and hopefully have those same connections that, that your high school teacher had with you then, too. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, that's what it's all about. Yes, absolutely. What was some of the best advice that you received as a student? Um, it's okay to say no. <laughs> it's important. <laughs> you have Still to make time. Still is good advice. Yeah. yeah. I'm really bad at it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, as a student, it was, it was don't, don't overextend yourself because I always wanted to do everything. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you can say no. You need to focus on you. And it's not just about the school. It's about yeah. a balance between school and personal life. That's true. I, you know, I, was, I was thinking, you know, it, better to say no at first than to say yes and, and then have to say no yeah. halfway through yeah. and everything falls apart. Yes. Yeah. Or at least take some time. It doesn't, you know, just... Yeah, uh, we don't need an immediate response in a lot of these cases. Yeah. When I've spoken to classes in the past, I've said, you know, you don't have to immediately respond to an email. You can give <laughs> yeah. it some time. I find it helps me. <laughs> <laughs> some of them you need to give a lot of time to. Yeah. Just uh, think about it. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is the last one, and this is fitting for the Cardinal Key advisor, who uh, <laughs> Cardinal Key is uh, instrumental in the lighting of Sea Hill mm-hmm. uh, every homecoming. But how many times have you been to the top of Sea Hill? Oh, um, I'm glad she's not just saying zero. No, <laughs> that'd be awkward. She's definitely been up there. <laughs> uh, yeah, four. This is my four or five. I've gone up every year since I've taken over as the advisor for Sea Hill. I've gone up sometimes carrying my children who have to be at the top but weren't big enough to go. Ah, okay. yes. So, um, yeah, and students have carried my children too. So props to the ones that helped out with that. <laughs> yes. Because I had two and they both wanted to be up there. Yeah, and it's a bit of a trek when it, you're lugging up a toddler. It is. It is. So I, I think four. Oh, that's Because I didn't do it my first year here. I know that for well, sure. Well, I know for the centennial, uh, you'll probably get up there. I'm sure. And do yeah. cartwheels. There we go. Even no, out. <laughs> there will be none of that. <laughs> I'll save that for people much younger than me. <laughs> well, you said your daughter has a gymnastics uh, yeah. competition. Maybe she can go up there and do some. A she, round, oh, she would. A round off. Is that what they're called? We round get, off I'm sure you, yeah. they, they run up to Sea Hill um, in the summer, so I'm sure we could get them to go up and do something. <laughs> They'd love it. There we go. Done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much uh, for your time, Mary. We certainly know that, you, that you're uh, very busy and very active on campus, and so we really appreciate you making the time for us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate yeah, it. Always a pleasure. Thank you.